Uh, you've heard that we made this Proud, the recipient of the 1987 award, One Person Makes a Difference. Talk to that point personally, professionally. How do you see the difference and how has it made a difference to you? Well, it makes all the sense in the world. I think it's wonderful that he has been selected for this award because he's always been interested in education. He's also been a firm believer in specialization and in-depth training in specific fields, which is really saying the same thing. Uh, he's always taken an extraordinary interest in young people and the development of young people. And we were all young people when we started out together at Bloomingdale's. Tell me about that. Tell me how you started out here because I know what the transition was, and I also know that well, he did, that in choosing you for this particular position, he really broke new ground. Well, I started out in Bloomingdale's as a um, decorating consultant on the fourth floor in the upholstery fabric department. Uh, at that time, Marvin Traub was, I believe, the assistant buyer or the buyer of hosiery in the basement as it was called in those days. And although I didn't work with him at all in those, at that time, uh, it was very soon that he was promoted to, um, I have to get my facts straight. I'm sort of talking and yeah, realizing that this just is Just don't worry about it. But uh, it seems to me that probably back about that time, he was uh, brought into Frank Chase's office, who was the merchandise manager for home furnishings, as an assistant to him. And uh, I got to know him at that time. But it was the very, 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 very beginning of the development and the growth of Bloomingdale's. Uh, Mr. Davidson was the chairman of the board at that time. And he was also very interested in the training and development of young people. Um, it was clear at that time that Mr. Trab was one of the people that was selected to be groomed for a higher position. But um, it was an incredible, extraordinary period of development that ensued in the next 10 years as Bloomingdale's moved from a neighborhood store of um, modest aesthetic <laughs> excellence, or however you'd want to explain it, to um, a very gradual move in the direction of um, being a fashion leader not only in the world of home furnishings, but of fashion. It had always been a strong home store. It was always. I, I was born around the corner in Bloomingdale's, and as a child, I was wheeled to the furniture department by my mother. So it always, but it, it certainly didn't have a fashion. It didn't edge. have a cachet. It was just, had a, um, a very nice middle of the road selection of furniture. But then that eventually began to change, probably around um, the late 40s and 1950s. Chase began to change that too, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, he started to change it, yes, exactly. And Henriette Granville was the fashion coordinator at the time. The home? She was the fashion coordinator for men's and the home, mm -hmm. because Frank Chase had both of those areas yeah. under his supervision. And. Um, it was during that period that um, she was doing the model rooms and there were um, the furniture of Rob's John Givings, which at the time was really very important and very fashion forward. Um, I remember coming for my first interview at Bloomingdale's and just being overwhelmed by the beauty of the rooms at that time with marble floors and multi-levels and beautiful collections of pre-Columbian pottery which at that time was really quite revolutionary. And I'm stuck. No, you went on <laughs> from there. The important thing to me was you moved into that arena and, moved and, and grew in that arena. But at one point, a very critical point, he plucked you out of, you were doing these incredible rooms. You have to bring me up to that point, where you became the person who was identified with the traffic building rooms at Bloomingdale's. 
uh, and this was an incomparable period. And he then had, as I remember it, the insight and the intelligence to say, if she knows how to create environments in which people want to live, why shouldn't that same expertise relate to making this store a place where people could enjoy shopping the things with which they live? Am I right? Yes. So let's talk to that whole thing. Well, I, th I think it really started earlier than that um, because I had been an assistant to Henriette Granville working on the model rooms. She selected all the colors and fabrics and uh, really set the tone for the rooms and I was responsible for uh, helping her put them together and helping her accessorize them, but all under her direction. There again, she was an excellent teacher and I was given extraordinarily good uh, direction for a period of about five years. At that time, she resigned from Bloomingdale's, and I received a phone call from Marvin Traub to accompany him to uh, Grand Rapids, which was then the important furniture market for the uh, our industry. And uh, riding out on the plane, he proposed that I should take over the position of designing and decorating the model rooms and working on the development of merchandise for Bloomingdale's. Really one of the things, most people think that all that I did or all of us involved in fashion coordination during that period, that all we really did was sit back and design model rooms. But the rooms were really a showcase for collections of merchandise that we felt made sense. And we traveled all over the world and created furniture, first in France and then in Italy, then in England, Spain, Portugal, uh, and we, and of course the Scandinavian countries. And the furniture kind of created the mood. Before we ever went off on these trips to Europe, we would sit and have uh, think tank sessions to come up with probable collections of furniture that made sense and that would be saleable at Bloomingdale's but would also have a fashion leadership image. Then we'd go off to Europe and we'd work on the design of them and we'd go over with all of our ideas in November, come back in January and really place the orders. Along with the development of the furniture, we worked on the design of rugs, fabrics, lamps, bought lots of antiques in the way of furniture um, and accessories to enhance the model rooms. And we're constantly working on opening up new markets and looking for new ways that we could reach out to enhance the already growing collection. So for years, along with doing the uh, model rooms, I was deeply involved in the uh, like development. The product development. Product development which was very important to our development at that time. I was not alone in this. Marvin Traub and Carl Levine and I worked really as a trio. Um, they very much involved with... Um, what was Marvin's position there? Marvin, let's see, was the merchandise manager for home furnishings. Uh, one and of Carl. the things and that... Carl. And Carl was the uh, early on, he would have been the buyer. Then he became a merchandise manager, but Marvin was the merchandise manager and vice president in charge of, um, well, I mean, this doesn't make sense yeah. with this, but there were two vice presidents. At that time, Friends. there were two vice presidents. No, it yeah. was um, Oliver Roberge was in charge of part of the home store and Marvin had the other part, which was furniture, rugs, and decorative accessories. Oliver Roberge had things like lamps, china glass, and silver, which really doesn't pertain to this. But the interesting things in the early days of development, which are uh, wonderful to look back and think about, were that we all traveled together and we investigated these markets in enormous depth from early in the morning until the wee hours of the morning. Very, very long days 
but going off into the countryside to visit someone that we thought uh, might have the wonderful old country chairs that we were looking for. Uh, going off into the countryside in another direction because we heard that there was a wonderful source for antiques. Because we were constantly looking for the inspiration in real antique pieces that would act as the source material for what we actually developed. We used research material in libraries, but we also used antique pieces. So we were, in the very early days, before Marvin became involved in many other parts of the store, traveling together to all of the craftsmen and artisans who were the original creators of the beginnings of our move toward a fashion image in the home store. And uh, that so was, a was, very, so was a very, very important cultural uh, imprint. Yeah. That, that very, rare, rare, very rare for retailers. Very rare for retailers. There are others who have done it, but we certainly did it for uh, many, many, many years and in great depth. Um, Marvin made the first trips to uh, France and Italy to probably it was in 1957 or 58. And uh, the chairs that are in his office right now that act as his, at his conference table were chairs that he bought in Italy on that very first trip. And I remember the fact that he called Carl Levine and I into his office one day and said, uh, tell me, you know, what do you think of these chairs? And he said, they are just fabulous. And where did you ever find them? And of course, it unfolded that he had found them up in the foothills of the Dolomites um, in the factory of a man who um, became one of our most important um, manufacturers of Italian furniture. But uh, there are many stories like that where um, you know, in Spain, in Portugal, in Italy, in France, um, we worked seven days a week, long, long, long hours. And um, no one really minded because it was a very exciting period of development. I keep repeating that because it was the very beginnings. That was the, what, what decade would you say? This would have been, um, 70s. No, no, this Early was in the 60s. 60s. I made my first trip to Europe for Bloomingdale's in 1958. And um, Marvin and Carl Levine had brought the drawings over on a November trip for furniture that I had designed in New York from research material that I had found here. And they put the samples into work. And then that following January or February, I went back over there to see the samples and to make any necessary adjustments. And it was at that time that the first commode that I had ever designed, I saw coming toward me on the back of a donkey, strapped to the back of a donkey, coming across the field toward the factory. Because at that time, some of the factories were really cottage industries where uh, the furniture was really made in various farmhouses around the countryside during the depth of winter. So, of course, that all changed because as the economy grew in Italy and as we placed more and more orders, we saw some of these very humble factories grow to great proportions and become very important to our business. But that kind of thing evolved not only in the furniture business, but um, you know, we bought lamp bases in India and lamp bases in Venice, you know, rock crystal in Venice, brass in India, lacquer in Japan, um, can turn wooden balustrade lamps in Italy, uh, uh, beautiful glass lamps in France, and it was one of those things where uh, the world just grew and grew as we uh, explored new territories. And it was in 1966, January, that um, a small group of us, including Marvin Crowd, uh, visited the Orient for the first time. And on that trip, we went to uh, China, Japan, Bangkok, uh, Hong Kong. As well as our regular stint through Europe, 
And that was the beginning of opening up the Orient. Of opening up the Orient. And then a few years later, we went to India. And that was the beginnings of opening up India, which has become a very important source to us. Well, uh, I don't know whether that. No, 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 the kind no. Of this is fine. It does, you know, just, just keep it but, going. Um, what you're saying is, though, that he was part of a. There was a unity of commitment to seeking out the really great, wonderful new ideas that were part of maybe the old craft yeah. ideas of, 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 of old world and, and, and the oriental culture. But what I'm really reaching for now is, is getting into where I am now. Not only where you, how you got where you are now, but what role did he play in, 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 in keeping this going? How did he, as someone, were you on uh, were you on a peer equal level at that point? No, no, no. He uh, was he was still he was leading in some way, wasn't he? Uh, during he this period, role? he was the merchandise manager, uh, and Carl Levine was the he was the um, vice president in charge mm -hmm. of home furnishings. So he was really leading this division, and he was leading new, this division into new territory. Would you say? Definitely. Um, I have to think a little bit All because right. Mr. Mr. Davidson was still around, mm -hmm. and Mr. Davidson was also constantly leading us into new territories. Mm -hmm. But this is the important thing was that at that point he was trying to um, dramatically increase our business, and uh, it was his belief that we could do it by creating unusual, distinct merchandise that was exclusive to Bloomingdale's. And we were able to do it in Europe and in the Orient and in India because of the uh, availability of craftspeople. Now, this was not just a matter of collecting and creative merchandise. The model rooms and the furniture floor were used as a showcase for the merchandise. Uh, we would come up with um, ideas for the model rooms. I would create images. This is going to be a room for, um, oh my heavens. A rock star. Well, no. Who is the, oh, for instance, I would sit there and say, uh, I think this furniture would be perfect for setting for Ernest Hemingway because he traveled around the world and he would have had an eclectic collection of things. Uh, and I would go through the seven or eight viewings that we were doing at the time and dream up personalities just for my own Story personal board. use to be able to develop a personality around a kind of person mm -hmm. and have the variety that we needed because it was very important uh, in a uh, store such as Bloomingdale's located in New York City. We knew that our customers were a diverse, uh, sophisticated, educated, well-traveled, well-read group of people. And it was our aim at that time to reach out to the various kinds of people involved in diverse professions and try to appeal to them. Of course, all of this was in home furnishings. And, uh, we did that not only by having a room based on English furniture, French furniture, then an Indian room, a Spanish room, in order to create many images during that period, but we also housed all of the collections of furniture out on the furniture floor. And we tried to create unusual vignettes using all of the accessories and lamps and rugs that we had found all over the world. That then progressed over a period of years. We were very successful and, and the business very grew well and grew and grew. And it was a really it was really the traffic building card that you had. I mean it was talked about, celebrated, and I must say, as as and, and during your period, more than it has ever been even since. It has never it has never manifested itself in the same and it hasn't had the same nature since you've left. I can tell you that. And, and you, uh, you know, whether well, or not the you thing feel is it. that 
it, it one of the things that I didn't time. say, one of the reasons why I keep saying it was such an exciting time was that although there were times when we would design a piece of furniture that wasn't as, that's as successful as we may have wished, for the most part, the business kept growing and growing and growing. And the excitement came from the fact that as a team, we were selecting things and doing things that worked. And there was a certain exhilaration that came out of that success. Um, well, I, room settings as a traffic building concept historically now. was not new, but it was the way you approached it. And it was developing the storyboard about people and, and, and breaking up this business of, of, of a room coming in as a set from uh, High Point. That, that, that was the difference. Yeah. And, 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 and what I'd like to have you come to as quickly as you can for us is at what point did Marvin, and was he the one who said, I want you to do it this way? Well, this is not for the tape, even though it will end right. up on the tape. But I reached the point where I had done the model rooms for 16 years, and I will have to get around to how we get to a smooth transition. I thought, if I do one more model room, I'm going to go crazy. If I, because it was they were the same spaces, and I did them four times a year for 16 years, mm -hmm. and I reached my limit, and I discussed this with him. And I said, if you can ever, it's hard for me to think where I can go from here after all of these years of experience, but I would think that I could be a valuable store. If in your wisdom you can find a spot for me, um, I'd love to get out of the model rooms and do something different. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we get gracefully from, that's, that's what really happened. He called up one day and said, I have something for you. I'm not sure about it. I want you to discuss it with your husband. This is an enormous transition for you. I want you to think about it over the weekend, but I'd like you to head up store design. And uh, I said, I'd like to do it. He said, I won't accept that. I want you to really think about it because it's too dramatic a transition. Mm -hmm. But I knew I wanted to do it. And I knew that I uh, had a lot to learn. Now, what do we say about that? <laughs> well, we say that that was a breakthrough recommendation that he was making because uh, we all know that uh, retailers uh, live in, in more often in gridlock uh, positions and con new concepts uh, for not just merchandise but for the movement of people don't happen. And the whole idea of seeing the validity of someone who understood the way people live and translating that into the right environment in which they should shop for the things with which they live was a very important breakthrough management decision, don't you think? Yes. I, I, I don't think know anyone I have who's a done feeling, it since. I have a feeling that it, it was done with a little, you know, that it was done. Doesn't matter. Even if it were, even if it was intuitive, the point is he did it. It took courage. It, first of all, it took the ability to, sit, to move out of a box. I don't know of any store that has done this for anyone who is in your field. Do you know anyone who's moved into store design or store planning? Oh, I'm sure from? it must have happened, but I, 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 I can't don't know think of anyone. anyone. I don't I know of anyone. Really think of as far anyone. as I'm concerned, you were the first, and I don't know. I've, I'm a pretty close reader, but uh, I don't know of anyone who's moved into it. The, the, the problem right now is that the visual merchandise people are taking over the store planning operation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they're moving the store planners out of position because visual merchandising is is is, is more sizzle and faster, and uh, and the people who are growing up in it are more uh, much more professional and much more new ways in their thinking. The store planning is still in the dark ages in many areas that people are in. Oh, definitely. So I I I think this was from the point of view of management decision making powerful difference and I don't care how it happened whether he only came to it because you charged him with the challenge him with the boredom but it was a big switch how else do you see him 
as having made a difference in retail. You well, always made a difference in your he life. Oh, absolutely. How does he leave? He's constantly. How does he leave? He's constantly reaching out. Uh, when you think that you've just about gotten to the point where you've figured out the right way to do something, it's time to move on. He's never. He's restless. Well, he's never static. It isn't so much that he's restless as it is that. Um, what was that? He is the grand orchestrator of this business, regardless of what anyone has to say. He is the one who is constantly challenging us all to reach further. Never satisfied with the fact that it's uh, merely a job well done, and I mean that in the best way possible. He is constantly challenging us to reach ever higher, and to reach out and to constantly be looking for new directions, to be um, risk taking. Oh, obviously, to be risk taking. But it isn't only a matter of um, constantly being on the lookout for new merchandise. That doesn't affect my life as much now, other than the fact that I have to be constantly aware of any new merchandise. But he is reaching out into the worlds of architecture, art, music, um, fashion, any of the things that influence the lives of the people who visit our stores. We're t in display, in store design, we are trying to create environments that are that reflect what's going on in the world in all of the fields of art and architecture and literature. Uh, for instance, whenever we have a um, major country event or store promotion, there are always cultural exhibits that represent the best of what the country involved in the promotion has to offer. Um, Therefore, education for retailing today, from his point of view, is what? Well, he is. He's constantly trying to educate the customer, and he's also constantly trying to educate all of us. To? To, to be aware of the cultural signals? Of the cultural signals that are around in New York and all over the world. Uh, let me see. You know, it's one of those things that is difficult when you are just a part of it, mm -hmm. and it's part of everyday life. You have to um, what do you mean? Well, let's put it on a very personal basis. Uh, what's the most important thing he's done for you? Well, over he, uh, I guess he recognized me as a talented person, and gave me every opportunity that I have had in the store to grow, and that has been going on for many, many years because um, uh, it was in twenty-five years ago or more that he gave me the opportunity to design the model rooms and to work with him on the development of merchandise. All right. Uh, what one And thing he has encouraged and developed me and given me the opportunity to develop over the period of years and given me enormous responsibility. What if you were talking about him to a group of uh, Europeans or Orientals? didn't know about How would you describe him as a man? In one simple sentence. Two. <laughs> Two. Three. Yeah. Paragraph. I don't care. Just, just, you know, you're sitting around, we're having drinks, and someone says, what do you, what's he like? What is he like? He's an extraordinarily energetic person. 
deeply involved in the business, knowledgeable about the most, most minute details of the business. Um, he has grown in this business from the bottom up and truly understands all of the various processes of the, even the lower levels of, um, oh dear, this is where I'm not good. I'm not, uh, I'm not a good verbalizer, but. Awareness doesn't matter, we're just talking in the living room now. I, you know, I, I'd like to know him through your through your feelings about this. Does he touch he you has in a human way? Does he oh. touch you in a human way? Oh yeah, he is an enormously human person. The important thing would be, certainly starting from the beginning, that um, he has an insatiable curiosity. Uh, he doesn't ever just skim the surface of any given problem. He is constantly delving into... He himself is a student of this business. He is a student he of this business. He's a self-educated person in terms of not only the business, but... He loves this business with a passion mm -hmm. that is unmeasurable. And he is involved in... Particularly in the... Uh, He's certainly involved. We've grown to be such an enormous business now that there are areas that he's not as involved in. But I, I'll tell you, when you ask me about Marvin Kraft, although I know lots about what he's doing now, if you truly ask me about Marvin Kraft, I think of the early days of the development, mm -hmm. how this whole business has grown. Mm -hmm. And I happen to be in a position where I have been a part of it and I have seen it grow. And the most important part of it was that he investigated every facet of every single business in Bloomingdale. It started out with home furnishings. Every part of it. Gift, china, glassware, investigating markets all over the world. He knows he knows those he, classifications. He thoroughly he understands the people in it those classifications and the people in them. He then moved on to the whole world of fashion and ready to wear. Same thing. Got to know all of the American manufacturers, traveled all over Europe, all over the world, meeting the designers, talking with them, working with our buyers, working with the fashion coordinators in developing the fashion end of our business and ready to wear. And that he worked on for many, many years. Probably Mr. Prinsky was his mentor in that area. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was. But, you know, what is it that makes him... It's the fact that he is involved in every aspect of the business. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the fact Not that... Not Not caused it. In accessible? Fact, oh, he's very accessible very accessible. For instance, in store design, he is involved in, he would probably like not to be, but he can't help himself. He's involved in every detail of what we do. But he loves architecture. Well, he loves architecture, but he's also involved in creating an atmosphere that is uh, exciting, daring, uh, and makes it fun for customers to shop in. All right, now you, let's stop this here for a moment, and now you tell me what distinguishes Bloomingdale for you today. Where does it stand in what we call this complex marketing time where department stores are under siege and are being written off by many, many sectors? Why? Why do you think that Bloomingdale uh, has not only achieved the position it has, but uh, what has made it an internationally known institution in Europe? Why hasn't it fallen into the same trap that so many others? 
Bernie Sanders. Well, part of the things that I've already stated in the sense that um, we have never sat complacently back and just thought, well, you know, we've done that very well and stopped at that point. Marvin Trout has always encouraged each and every one of us to reach be constantly reaching for new resources. For instance, for the people that are involved in merchandising, um, he is constantly reaching for new designers, looking for young people who aren't really well known but who show potential, that, um, that we will show their clothes in order to make them become, to give them an audience. Um, he, we're constantly, we, we've never just sat still. I know that this, none of this sounds good for this thing. <laughs> fine, fine. You're not the only one who's talking, so let yeah. it fine. The main thing is that we are constantly reaching for new ideas. Mm -hmm. The, you know, one of the things that I haven't said is the fact that there is an extraordinary amount of teamwork. There is no one person who does it all. Uh, yeah, teams are supposed to make camels, not horses. You know, for teams, there are... How do you have a creative process with teams? What's the, what's the secret there? Since, since consensus often dilutes the creative process. Usually people think that people like myself just dream of creative architectural design and just put them on paper and they're used. Nothing that we do is done for aesthetic reasons. It is all driven by the business. All right, that, this is exciting. Tell me how store planning. What about the store planning process at Bloomingdale makes it as true as we need? Any major renovation or any change in the design of a department is something that has come about as a result of changes in the business or a need to make a change in the business. It is driven by the fact that um, we either need to enlarge our ready-to-wear area. I don't know how much, how deep, how detailed. Excuse me for any of these concerns. No, that was never confirmed. I had said that it. Uh, no, I don't. Because uh, Glenn Sank's secretary had said that I said that we cannot have the meeting unless Karen Wenzel is here, and Karen Wenzel is not here. No, I'll let them know that. Say that it was never confirmed, and I've made other arrangements. Would you do one of those things for me? Would you call the commissioner and tell him that we have Gordon Cook and tell him that we down in five minutes. Okay. Gordon Cook is in advertising. Okay. Uh, store design today is very different from what it was even five years ago. Uh, you, you made history with throwing away the mold with your cosmetic approach to color. What now? What drives it now? What's making the difference now? What is, what's the different philosophical point that has come down from management, specifically Marvin? How has he affected store design thinking? There's always a need to grow the business. Let's face it, retailing, retailing is built on ways to increase square foot revenue. Mm -hmm. That's Marvin and the other merchants are constantly looking for ways to grow the business. Now, in the process of doing that, there are certain businesses that are destined, that they recognize are the ones that are ready to grow or can be grown. And 
usually, I can't do it this way. I have to, uh, I have trouble right. with this kind of All thing. All right, let me ask you one In question. other words, for I'm instance, probably when you speak to him, when you speak to someone else, we have just, last year we opened a new fourth floor. Yeah, let's talk about that. The reason for doing the new fourth floor was the fact that we knew, we yeah, collectively. collectively knew that we needed to grow the fashion ready to wear business. We needed to have individual shops with important fashion collections and fashion designers. There was no way that we could do it in the space that we had allocated. So it meant Marvin and the merchants and all of us were involved in discussions over a period of maybe two or three years that involved how were we going to reallocate all of the square footage in Bloomingdale's in order to free the entire fourth floor of all the businesses that existed there in order to be able to have all of the designer merchandise together, the fashion designer merchandise. And that was a very long and involved project that involved doing detailed block plans for every floor in the store. It involved taking almost the entire buying organization and moving them to a headquarters, which is a couple blocks away from Bloomingdale in order to recapture important space that was, as we call it, behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So there was an enormous master plan. Anything that we do is planned on paper. Uh, in addition to, for instance, it isn't just for aesthetic reasons that you decide that a certain fashion designer should be a, in the shop of a certain that size. That I understand, but you do have an aesthetic decision-making power. And it is your eye, and it is your taste that he is counting on. So whatever happened on that floor, or whatever happened in the cosmetic area, was you were very much a part of that. That's that true. Not true. That is true. And, and you led the way. And, and really what I'm saying right now is, what, what is the aesthetic of Bloomingdale? Can you, can you capture that for me before we leave? What is the Bloomingdale aesthetic? What are the guidelines? What's the criteria? Uh, do you know, I've been asked that question so many times. We've never really come up with an All answer. Right. Right. We've never really, uh, do you know what I really believe it is? I am asked that question so frequently, and um, I have a difficult time coming up with the answer, and I oh. always revert back to the fact that there is a team effort, because although B-Way grew out of the fact that um, well, you surely didn't see it in pink and blue. Uh, something <laughs> like B-Way grew out of the fact that when you have, Bloomingdale's had no main floor at all. Bloomingdale's had no historic image. And when the time came to create an image for the main floor of Bloomingdale's, I kind of looked to the one thing that had some historical background, which was the fact that the exterior of the building on Lexington Avenue was Art Deco. Well, I didn't feel that we, I could all of a sudden make the entire inside of Bloomingdale's Art Deco, but at least it gave us some reason for carrying some of that inside. Now, most main floors of stores across the country are either white, or they're off-white, or they're beige, or um, there might be some that are peach color. And none of those seemed to fit what we wanted to do. We wanted to be a little bit more dramatic and a little bit more daring. And um, many years ago, when Marvin and I and a group of other Bloomingdale merchants were in India, I was in the room with a black and white marble floor. 
and we were still groping for some direction to take. Mm -hmm. And um, I asked Marvin if he would, if, you know, if the whole group would come and see my room, which was happened to be extraordinarily beautiful in the Lake Palace Hotel in Udo here. And um, I felt that it was a neutral, that any color would go with it, but that it also offered some excitement and some drama. And I did, at the, at the time, Marvin felt that it was an interesting idea that we should just think on it. We'll sit on that and see what else comes mm -hmm. along, but that, that's not a bad idea. But, you know, that's how that started. Mm -hmm. And um, it kind of grew from there. And for Boca, what was the, what was the aesthetic? Well, for Boca, um, the left the Boca bag. This is my this is my office, my Boca office <laughs> that has just come back with me. We knew that because it was a store in Florida that we wanted it to be a very open frame, very airy, light colors, very pleasant, something that would fall into the atmosphere of a uh, tropical climate. And um, you know why it's so difficult? I, this is never going to. I hope I'm satisfying you, you a are, little bit. You are. It's all a long story. None of it is ever simple. It has really grown. It evolves. It all evolves. For instance, there are certain things that we know work. Once again, it's the team effort. There are certain things, for instance, and this isn't something for it to be broadcast at a dinner. But um, it's all of these little things that add up. Everyone is putting their input into it. Let's say this. The vice president who is in charge of fashion accessories has very definite ideas about how she feels certain things should be shown. We listen to everything that she has to say and then use our aesthetic abilities to select the right materials in order to give her what she wants. Mm -hmm. She has really come up with exactly what it is she wants, and we apply our aesthetic and translate it. And, translate it. Mm -hmm. and we really do that throughout the entire store, so that it isn't as though you just say, oh, okay, now we're going to do a certain kind of look. It all works together. It is while you are sitting and listening to what it is you need to do in order to accomplish the merchandising objectives of the store, you then, based on what all of these people are telling you, hopefully absorb all of that and you recast, recast it. it. I, I understand the creative process, but then, it, then, then what you're saying to me it is because the people here are to begin with, selected for their unique ability to be ready for change and to s catch the winds of change, and they're open to it, that whatever happens here collectively in this team process does, in the end, give you the difference here with Lindsay. You said it perfectly. I also would, I wish I could have said it as well. <laughs> I, I also would, would, would observe that the fact that this is that this particular structure may I just finish the sentence? That this particular building, because it is not a simple shape, has created many more interesting shopping environments. Because it isn't a box. It wasn't built as a box. Mm -hmm because it is multi-level, and then because it is a little bit of a cul-de-sac here and a cul-de-sac yeah, there. Yeah, well, we wish we could get rid I know of you. Those, I know you do, <laughs> but it's one of the things that creates not only a challenge for you, but it also makes it a more interesting, although difficult, to uh, maneuver store, mm -hmm. but it does make it a more interesting store than one where you walk in with absolutely certain there's, there's, you know, it's, it's a catch-22 part of it. Anyway, thank you. Anyway, I'm sure there's lots of